but thank you, Lord, for your word. We're going to dwell a bit in the book of Proverbs. Love the book of Proverbs. He loves the book of Proverbs. Give me a, a little wave. I was sharing with the school uh, one Tuesday night how the book of Proverbs is profound because it is a book of wisdom, yes. But it's not just wisdom for living in this life, which I, I know that it is. It's practical wisdom. And I encourage you that if, you've, if you lack wisdom, if you're finding that you've, you're struggling with finances and relationships and doing the right thing day to day and go to Proverbs, dwell in Proverbs. It will help us in day-to-day -day living. But there is a, a higher level of understanding. There is a higher sight, a higher seeing, I believe, that comes from this book, a wisdom that is heavenly, a wisdom which is the revelation of Christ himself, a revelation that brings the ways and the knowledge of God. Who loves the ways of God? Give me a, a quick wave. That's, that's knowing him. There's no greater, no greater riches. There's no greater pursuit than to know him. And today's message is called Staying True in Love. Staying true in love. In Proverbs 18.22, this is the Amplified. Proverbs 18.22, Amplified, says, He who finds a true and faithful wife finds a good thing and obtains favor and approval from the Lord. He who finds a true and faithful wife finds a good thing and obtains favor and approval from the Lord. Now, your version might just say, he who finds a good wife, which is good. But I love the Amplified here that says, he who finds a true and faithful wife finds a good thing. Now, this is often thought of, of course, you know, when we're doing sometimes marriage counseling or those sorts of things, this, this verse will come up and we'll talk about it in physical marriage. But you know what? There's a higher marriage. He who finds a true and faithful wife, I'm talking about Jesus and his bride. And I want to tell you, I hear the cry from heaven of a bridegroom. And I saw him looking over the vastness of Australia and how parched and how dry it was. And I heard the cry saying, where is my Australian bride? <laughs> where is my true and faithful wife? I am searching. I am searching. <laughs> the word of God says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth, looking, searching, desperate, looking for those who are fully committed to him. That sounds like a marriage, fully committed. I'm in this for life. And I believe God is speaking to us, a true and faithful wife, fully committed. Can I just be frank? If you can't make it to church because you're too tired or something else in life has gotten in the way, you're not fully committed if you can't get to the house to seek the Lord, something else, another lover has come in. And that is the truth. And I say that with love. You need to repent. You have lost your first love.
You've lost it. You're an adulterer. He who finds it true and faithful. She has to be faithful. Now that word finds in Hebrew is matzah. And in the Jewish tradition, when a couple were married, they would say to the bridegroom, matzah, you found. You found. I want to tell you, God is searching to find those who are fully committed. You know what happens in a Jewish marriage? There are many traditions, many, many traditions. I love weddings. <laughs> when I go to a wedding, it could be complete strangers. I, I don't know you from a bar of soap, but when those two eyes lock, when that wedding music starts and she's in her bridal gown and she's walking down and the bridegroom turns around and their eyes lock. There's just something that I just burst into tears because of the way you can tell they're in love. <laughs> Do you remember there was the um, royal wedding of Princess Mary, who is an Australian, right? Australian bride uh, marrying, was it the Danish yeah. prince? The da prince, what's his name? Frederick. And that moment when she arrived and he turned around and all the world were watching on TV and he burst into tears and you could see this man loves her and she loves him. There is a first love that is unmistakable. You cannot manufacture that. You cannot put that on. It is, they have fallen in love. They have become so intertwined. They are in their thoughts day and night. They have been looking forward to this very moment. Just something from the inner place just bursts out. That's how we should be in prayer, shouldn't it? When we're in first love, Lord, <laughs> come, come quickly. And you know, in a, a Jewish marriage, one of the most iconic traditions is this tradition where it's unusual, but you know, every culture has its tradition. Like um, they have a glass and they wrap it in some tea towel or something and they put it on the floor and they break the glass. Sometimes it's just the groom, sometimes it's the groom and the bride and they break this glass. And they go, muzzle tough. <laughs> I love these amazing traditions. You know, when we were married, because I'm Chinese, we had a tea ceremony. And that's a Chinese tradition. And uh, I know we've got a couple getting ready to marry here. You might have your own traditions of things that you bring that are part of who you are. It's going to be an exciting, wonderful celebration. But in the Jewish tradition, it's this strange breaking of the glass. And I was reading up about this. It's a bit of fun, but there's great meaning in it. And some of Jewish traditions, they, they believe that this speaks of a couple things. One of them was, even though in this beautiful celebration of a, a wedding and this joyous occasion, there was this remembrance that as Jews, we remember the breaking we remember when, the temp when we were taken out of our temple and the temple was desecrated and destroyed. That's one meaning of that breaking of the glass. But there's another meaning that Jewish historians believe is significant. And that is a speaking of this breaking which happened when Moses came down from the mountain with the tablets and he saw the idolatry, the spiritual adultery, and he threw those tablets down and his heart was broken and the tablets were broken. And it's this remembrance. 
it's very strange. This is supposed to be a joyous, wonderful occasion. Everyone's happy, everyone's dancing, everyone's celebrating. But in this moment, there is this remembrance of this brokenness. And it is a picture of the brokenness God had over the spiritual adultery of his own bride. And so it's, it's almost a, an ominous thought that remember this, this covenant you're entering into is a promise for life. But there is a possibility here if you are no longer fully committed, there can be a breaking. <laughs> he was warning about spiritual adultery, remembering now, the thing about glass, they would not break, you know, crockery or it was glass. The thing about glass is that it can be melted down. I was reading about this, about the significance of it, the prophetic significance, but it can be melted down again, even if, it, if it's been broken and it can be reformed. Now, I believe that's God's encouragement. That if we've let our heart wander, and that happens in a day-to-day -day thing, doesn't it? That God can still melt down <laughs> that idolatry if we come and repent. And he can reform <laughs> what is a true first love. And, you know, this week, prophetically, um, I was meant to hang out with Narel, but the day before I opened the fridge and this glass container that I had unwisely <laughs> stored precariously in the shelf fell down onto my foot <laughs> and bruises this big heavy glass with chicken in it, <laughs> of all things. <laughs> And, oh, I was sore. I had to put my foot up. I had to put ice on it. I couldn't walk properly. You know what the word says? Unless we fall on the rock and be broken to pieces, the rock will fall on us and we will be crushed. And so the Lord is speaking. <laughs> Are we too chicken to hear <laughs> the truth of it? A true and a faithful wife he wants to find, and it is a good thing. Now, how does a marriage break down? I know that we've done marriage counseling, Chris and I, over the years. How does a marriage usually break down? How does an affair start? It's usually little by little. It's usually not a sudden thing. It's usually day by day a little of your affection given to some, someone else or something else. Maybe there's a colleague at work that you've been working with starts to get lots of nights or you have to partner up with someone of the other sex and you begin to share hearts and then some weeks go by and all of a sudden you're texting one another you you know at first it was about work but now oh I'm going through something I what do you think about this and and all of a sudden the affection of some thought someone else creeps in and then all of a sudden your thought life becomes excuses. <laughs> well, I don't, just don't love you anymore to your wife or your husband. This person meets my needs. This person understands me. I've changed. You've changed. The thing is that in a spiritual marriage, God doesn't change. It's we that change. <laughs> right? He's perfect. His love never fails. His love is constant is perfect but we start little by little our affection for something else our thought life is consumed with something else you know when you're in love with something 
you'll think about them all the time. You know, I love that, you know, Chris has been home for the last two two years. It's been it's been awesome. But it's also he's been ready and raring to go back to work and just this week as he's gone back to work, he's really enjoyed it. But what I've loved is that he calls me all the time. <laughs> like not just once a day, like I would say a couple times a day. You know, and you know what that says to me? He's thinking about me. And he comes to me because he wants to just share something on his heart or what was on the news or what happened with his colleague or what's coming up at work. Or... But he's coming to me. You know, that's love. That's intimacy. It's a couple, you know, it's not just once a day. It's, that's the love that we are to have with our bridegroom, isn't it? You're always thinking about him. You're always, Lord, what's on your heart? Lord, you, you're always turning to him. That's the cultivating and the keeping of first love, isn't it? And, you know, we're married 20 years this year. <laughs> In April is our 20th anniversary. And I don't know about you, but it takes a lot of work <laughs> to maintain real love. It's, it's not an easy happy-go-lucky thing, it's something that you have to be deliberate about, about cultivating, about growing, about keeping the fire going. Now, in that instance of an affair, you know, what we counsel a lot of couples about is usually the same theme, and it is, what does love look like? And we find that along the way sometimes with couples, or especially if they've come from a dysfunctional you know, background, it's this relearning, this saving of the soul according to the word, what the word says, what does love look like? In other words, what does Christ look like? But practically, what does love look like in a marriage or in relationships? And the word refines and the word renews our mind into what love is. Now, love is not letting your heart drift little by little. See, if it's love, that colleague, you wouldn't even go near that person. If you love your wife, if you love your husband, you would go to your boss and say, look, is there any way that you can pair me up with someone else or I can, you know, continue this project. I, this is not good. That's love. You don't want to even be around temptation. You're willing to give it up. See, that's the test. See, love has to be tested. Job said that you tested me, O Lord, and I came forth as gold. That love has to be tested. What does love look like? It doesn't even go near the temptation of anything that takes the place of Jesus. If there's anything that begins, you know, little by little, your affection, your thought life, your emotion, your desire, your, what gets you excited? You remember, you know, on a, you know, on a date, you're excited to see that person or... Or you ha if you haven't seen your husband or your wife or someone for a while, you're excited to see them. What happens when you're no longer looking forward to seeking him, looking forward to spending time with him? This, that's been lost. You've got to cultivate that again. <laughs> Something else has taken your imagination, your affection. Now, the trick with that is you've got to fast from that. <laughs> you've got to come away from it. Don't even go near that temptation. That'll test. Lord, even that doesn't come close to my love for you. Now that can be anything. That's the idolatry. That's the golden calf. That can be ministry. That can be things of God. That can be career. Lord, I give you my career, possessions, relationships. 
See, relationships have become a God in the church. This kind of relationship. But can I suggest something to you? That God gives us horizontal relationships, yes, to bless us, but that's only secondary. He gives us relationships so that we can understand our relationship to him. Right? When he gave Adam Eve, yes, he saw that he needed help. I know that men sometimes need help. (laughs) The other side of that coin is that we women need to be helpers. You know, it doesn't help when we're arguing that fact and we have to be right. That's not being a helper. That's not helpful right now. (laughs) So the two have to become one, right? But he gave Eve, I believe, not just because he needed physical somebody to help him. He gave him Eve so that he could have a revelation of Christ and his bride. That's Revelation 22, isn't it? Let's go there. Revelation 22. Just pull up my notes here. Verse 17, the Holy Spirit and the bride, the church believers, say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take and drink the water of life without cost. The Holy Spirit and the bride is the revelation of him coming back and Turning to the left, Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, vanished, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed like a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will live among them and he will be they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be death there will no longer be sorrow and anguish or crying or pain for the former order of things has passed away and then we want to skip down to verse 9, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven final plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a vast and lofty mountain and showed me the holy sanctified city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having God's glory filled with his radiant light the brilliance of it resembling a rare and very precious jewel, like jasper, shining and clear as crystal. Now note that it's talking about jewels. It's talking about the bride. I want you to go back now to Proverbs 31. Here is the bride. We talk about this a lot in women's ministry. The bride the woman, and we talk about it from day-to-day life here on this earth point of view of what a godly woman looks like. But I want us to come now to Proverbs 31 from the perspective of the spiritual bride. What does a spiritual bride look like? Remember, he's looking for a true and a faithful bride. And it says, an excellent woman, verse 10, one who is spiritual, capable, intelligent, and virtuous. Who is he who can find her? Matzah. (laughs) God is looking for his bride. Her value is more precious than jewels. And her worth is far above rubies or pearls. The heart of her husband trusts in her. 
he will have no lack of gain. So she's precious. She's a jewel. She's rare. There is a remnant, friends, of the bride. And the Lord is searching her out. In verse 18, it says, Her lamp does not go out. Her lamp does not go out. We're talking about the spiritual wife now, the spiritual bride. Her lamp does not go out. What did he say to the Ephesians church? You have lost your first love. I'm about to remove your lampstand, your lamp. That is Christ himself, the revelation of Christ himself. It says here of the true bride, her lamp does not go out. That flame, day and night, does not go out. That revelation of Christ in her never burns out. She burns for him right to the end. Verse 25, it says she prepares her house. Now, this is awesome in the Amplified Classic. I've got to read it out to you. Amplified classic. It's awesome. It says, Strength and dignity are her clothing, and her position is strong and secure. She rejoices over the future, the latter day or time to come, knowing that she and her family are in readiness for it. Now, that's not just speaking of natural house, that's talking about spiritual house. She is getting her family, her house, ready for the latter days, the future, the coming of the Lord. This is the sign of the true bride. They talk about Jesus is coming soon. Get ready. They talk about eternity. There is a preparation for what is to come. There is a preparation and a looking to the bridegroom returning. Then we go to the most famous passage of this. Verse 30 says, Amplify Classic, Charm and grace are deceptive. Beauty is vain because it is not lasting. But a woman who reverently and worshipfully fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates of the city. Now, again, this is talking about the church. Charm and grace is deceptive. I want to tell you, charm and grace and beauty has come into and taken the place of Christ himself. You've got to have that beautiful stage. You've got to have those beautiful people. You've got to have those things that actually, in effect, pass away. The charm. Oh, I love the pastor. He, you know, I come into church and I feel better going out. He, he you know, tells me a word of faith and he makes me feel good. And he comes around and he tells me the things that make me, you know, feel better and good about myself. And I really love that pastor. That's called charm. Grace, hyper grace has come into the church, has it not? That taken the place of truth. You no longer need to repent. There's no conviction of sin. There's no talk of the judgments of God, which are throughout Scripture. God becomes a lackey for man. Charm is deceptive. Charm and grace is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting. But a woman, a church, the true bride who fears the Lord is to be praised. Is the fear of the Lord there? Is there a conviction that there's sin? Is there a dealing with the self coming to the cross? Dealing with lukewarm half-heartedness. If that's not there, if the fear of the Lord is not there, it is not the bride. It is a harlot. Now I want to talk about what that looks like. 
Because Proverbs also says, Proverbs 21.9, it is better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. We wives hate that verse. <laughs> it's like conviction. <laughs> you know, it's like every day it's like, Lord, I repent. But I want to talk about this in regards again to the spiritual wife, the church. And it is so important that it's not just in Proverbs 21.9. It's repeated again, word for word, in Proverbs 25.29. Oh, 24, sorry, Proverbs 25, 24. It is better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. What's a contentious woman? It is the wife that argues against the will of the husband. Now, as we know, God, the husband, is perfect, isn't he? Now, if your husband's asking you to do something sinful, then that's not okay. You know, that's, that's not, you're not to go along with that. But here we're looking in the regards of Christ, the bridegroom, and we, the bride. If we are in contention with the will of God, given to us by the word of God, you know what it says? Jesus would rather be on the corner of the roof. He's gone. He's not there. He doesn't want to be there. <laughs> That's the picture of spiritual adultery. You will not submit to the will of God. Obey God. <laughs> the Lord doesn't want to be in that house. <laughs> I want to end on some insights on some biblical stories that we know well, but I want to bring out again this aspect of this higher meaning when we think of we, the spiritual bride, the church, and Christ, the bridegroom. In John 8, 1 to 11, let's go there. Isn't it wonderful for the Lord to take away the veil so that we can see as he sees? You know, it sets us free, doesn't it? Even if it's something we don't want to see. I want to see as God sees. In Isaiah, it talks about the watchman looking for his return and they will see eye to eye with him. That's the eye to eye of the bride in that moment with the bridegroom. They lock eyes. They see eye to eye. They see what the bridegroom sees. That's that intimacy. That's the true bride. We want to see what you see in this scripture. And I'll read it out so that it's fresh in our minds. But it says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning at dawn. He came back into the temple court, and the people came to him in crowds. He sat down and was teaching them. When the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, he's at adultery again, they made her stand in the middle of the court and put the case before him. Teacher, they said, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such women offenders shall be stoned to death. But what do you say to do with her that is your sentence? This they said to try or test him, hoping that they might find a charge in which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. However, when they persisted with their question, he raised himself up and said, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he bent down and went on writing on the ground with his finger. They listened to him and then they began going out. Conscience stricken. That's a good word, isn't it? Conscience stricken. One by one, from the oldest down to the last one of them, till Jesus was left alone with the woman standing there before him in the center of the court. When Jesus raised himself up, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one, 
Has no man condemned you? She answered, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go on your way. And from now on, sin no more. Now I want you to keep this story in mind and backtrack to John 2, where, John, where the Lord Jesus has founded a wedding. We're talking about weddings again, isn't he? And he is in a place where he performs his very first miracle, turning the water into wine. Remember that? But he's there sitting in a wedding and it's prophetic. And he's in Cana of Galilee. Cain is, Cana means Cain, which is a picture of discipline. The true bride receives the disciplines as well, right? The corrections in love. But here we see Jesus at the wedding and his mother says to him, they've run out of wine. And Jesus says to his mother, why do you bother me? It is not yet my time. Now, some believe that that was about his performing a miracle. But I believe that that was him speaking of his wedding to come. He was sitting in that physical wedding thinking of Father, my spiritual bride, I've come to prepare my spiritual bride. I'm going to bring her back. I'm going to make a way for her to come back to me. And there is a wedding waiting for me. And this wedding reminds me of that fact. And you, could, you can just feel his heart going, I can't wait. I can't wait for this wedding. And so with that in mind... Here is the other side of the coin. Now we find Jesus in John 8, face to face with a woman who's in adultery. And these people around her willing to condemn her with stones in their hands, ready to kill her. Because what does the Mosaic law say? If they're found in the act of adultery, you die. That's how severe sin is. That was a picture. God was trying to get the point through to his people. You commit adultery, it's death. That's the seriousness of sin. But yet, he wrote in the sand. First, I believe he began to write some of their sins in the crowd. <laughs> Then they didn't get it. The second time he writes something, I don't know what he wrote. Nobody knows. <laughs> but can I suggest to you something? Maybe it was the word spiritual adultery. Arrow, 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 arrow. <laughs> they were conscience stricken. <laughs> He had called out their sins. And he said, you were standing there with a stone in your hand, ready to stone this woman for physical adultery. What about your spiritual adultery? And they were conscience stricken and one by one they left. And he said to the woman, go and sin no more. See, the Lord was thinking spiritually. And you know what? He gave his life even knowing that his people would be spiritually adulterous. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterous people, you have friendship with the world. So Lord, I thank you. For your word, John eight fifteen to 16. When we don't see as God sees, he says, you set yourselves up to judge according to the flesh by what you see. You condemn by external human standards. I do not set myself up to judge or condemn or sentence anyone. Even if I do judge, my judgment is true. My decision is right. Amplified classic. For I am not alone in making it. 
but there are two of us, I and the Father who sent me. And Luke 18, 8, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now we read that and often it's in the context of, will he find faith? Are you doing miracles? Are you doing this? Are you, have you got faith for doing stuff for the Lord? But I want to propose to you something else. When the Lord comes back, will he find faith, faithfulness on the earth? A good and faithful wife, he who finds a true and faithful wife, finds a good thing. That scripture, he who finds, will he find faith on the earth? That's in the context of the widow who was crying out for justice. Do you remember that? Day and night. That was a sign of first love. That flame that would not go out. Let's just stand to our feet as we wrap up today. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Father. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Oh, Lord, we look forward to a wedding. <laughs> we look forward to a wedding, Lord. But, Lord, my prayer is that you would make hearts steadfast, enduring in love. This marriage, this love, this engagement is a marathon. <laughs> but Lord, let us run to get the prize. Let us not grow weary. Let us not grow lukewarm. Let us not lose sight. Let us finish well, we pray. Lord, I pray for fresh insight this morning. Lord, of what it is to be a true and a faithful bride. Oh, Lord, that you would find a true and a faithful wife in this heart, in this place, in this church, in this city, in this land. You are searching for a bride. You want to matza a bride. Oh, Lord, we ask that you would Make a faithful people. And today, Lord, where there has been an inclination of heart elsewhere, where there has been a seduction, a luring away, little by little, day by day, affection to something else. Something else has taken your place. Something else has given us satisfaction. Something else has given us excitement And it, before you. <laughs> Oh, Lord, I pray that you would bring that to the fore today, that we may repent, Lord. And if you need to bring that before the Lord today, just confess it before him. Oh, Lord, I'm coming back to you. I want to be besotted. I want to be in love. I want to burn with holy fear. Lord, that everything pale in comparison to you. One thing I ask, one thing I seek, it's you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I pray that there would be a quickness of conviction and repentance to any other lover. Anything that has taken your place, any affection, Oh, Lord, Holy Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord come, we pray. To have the fear of the Lord is to be quick to repent. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bring us back to you. First love. First love, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Thank you, Lord. Bless each one as we go today with first love. What was a reminder to the Ephesus church? Do what you did at first. That excitement and that first moment with you, that first date. Oh, Lord, restore that to us, we pray. Restore the joy of our salvation, Lord. The joy of being with you. And if you want that restored, just reach out your hands to him today, Lord. Restore that joy, that excitement, that, that adoration, I, that love, that adoring. <laughs> I woke up this morning with that, that song, That's Amore. <laughs> da, 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 da. That's Amore. <laughs> Lord, it's a silly song, but it's all about love. <laughs> Oh, Lord, that song of songs, love, devotion, that adoration, Lord, restore it to our hearts. That every other lover would pale. Every other love would pale in comparison to the one. Thank you for the joy of love. The restoration of true love. This morning we pray. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.